Ponder this. With the general election right around the corner, the nation may just witness the ascension of the United States' very first female president. With the first female president, the first first gentleman is also a distinct possibility. Excuse that thought me? has not escaped the imagination of acclaimed author, a former chief of staff in the U.S. House of Representatives, political analyst, among other things, Gerald Weaver, who has penned his second novel with that very same title. The First First Gentleman is a novel, a love story and a thriller, all the while providing honest and insightful commentary on the nation's political system. And I'm pleased to have joining us now to discuss all of this and the current state of politics, Gerald Weaver. Very nice to have you here with us. Thank you for having me here. Now, people I'm sure will see this title and think, well, he just must have written this about two months ago. No. Reality is, how long ago did you start working? Well, actually, the U.S. copyright is April 2014, so I started it three years ago. And what was it, you know, I, I always love to ask authors, where did the idea come from? So where did this idea come from? Well, it came from two places. One of the things I saw coming was that the American voter were hungry for any candidate who was going to puncture the political orthodoxy. They, voters have seen uh, candidates speak canned speeches and follow the polls and they were just waiting for somebody to break out of the mold. And in a way, Obama, by his identity, broke out of the mold. So I think that there's a hunger for that. And the second thing I, I think I see coming, and I, I wanted to sort of hurry along, is I think there's going to be a change in gender roles at some point. Maybe not in my lifetime, but soon. So let's talk about the book, because I, I, I want people to understand. This, it is a novel. It is both a thriller and a love story, which is sort of an interesting combination here. So let me ask you to tell us a little bit about each of the main characters, enough for us to tease our viewers here that they're going to want to do this. So you start off with Melinda Sherman, all right? Right. And who is Melinda Sherman? Melinda Sherman's a sort of psychologically and physically wounded war hero who grows up and has a difficult family, and uh, she's got issues to overcome, and um, she never has an idea of running for Congress. She goes and serves in the Navy, and she's a pilot, and she uh, fights in the Iraq War, and she's kind of lost, actually. And then she meets Garth Teller, who's the male, and he's considerably older. He's a divorced father, and one of the reasons I wanted to cast this relationship like that is he does very little else besides support and nurture her, but he's still a manly man. This is So this is the first first gentleman and helps to re remake um, gender roles, because he's still a man, but he's able to play a secondary role. And she likes him because he's nurturing, and he actually nurtures her to the point of being a tremendously successful politician. And as we say, not just a political novel or a sort of a love story here, but also a thriller. What's right. going on here that that's, is going to thrill the readers? Well, it's um, there are dark forces at work who obviously don't want to see her become president. Some of them are conservative and some of them misogynistic and some of them uh, just uh, don't like her. So um, there's uh, elements from both their pasts as well, which is sort of Dickensian, but... They're being tracked and followed, and you sort of know what the outcome is going to be, but hopefully you care enough about the characters that you that you pay attention to. When you were writing these these characters, did did any elements of any of the other political figures that you've either encountered in your life or are out there now, did any of them make their way into these characters? Well, certainly, like I said, Obama was a. a a game changer and an unorthodox candidate by virtue of his identity. But um, I thought of uh, Rand Paul and some other characters who had sort of been on the fringes but never ever were picked up. And I, and I figured that somebody who just started saying different things would be popular. I didn't really have anybody particular in mind, but um, Calvin Trillin, the great um, humorist, once said, if you start to write satire in this day and age, and, he was speaking in Nixon and Reagan. Mm -hmm. What happens is reality will exceed the satire by the time the book is off the presses. <laughs> and sort of has happened to that. My candidate um, says a lot of unorthodox things that have been echoed by both Trump and Sanders. Let me, let, let's talk a little bit about, about current day politics. As I mentioned in the introduction, you were at, at one point in time the youngest chief of staff in the House of Representatives, you've worked as a, as a political analyst, as a lobbyist. Right. And I've seen all aspects of this. If, if, and as a writer here, all right, if, how would you, uh, if you were going to pen in a couple of sentences this campaign that's taking place, presidential campaign in 2016, 
Uh, what sort of captions do you think you'd look for? The reality television has collided with news television and the 24-7 um, news cycle. And I think it's changed what we consider news or even politics dramatically. Dramatically, it's a, um, a lot of people are, you know, waiting to see what happens next. And I think Trump gets away with a lot because it's always a new crazy thing that comes up. And so... Um, when, let me ask you something. You mentioned Donald Trump, and, and, and we've had people come on to, to talk about him. They've, they've criticized him. We've had people come on to, who support him. But I'm, I'm struck by one thing. You and I talked about this one time before. Um, you worked with uh, Joe Biden and his campaign in the state of Pennsylvania right. when he was running for president. And people may well remember, some might not, that, that essentially he was kind of forced you know out of the campaign because of allegations that he had plagiarized part of a speech. When you look at the accusations being delivered at both of our candidates now, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, it almost seems quaint that somebody would be forced off the campaign trail because they allegedly plagiarized a couple of lines from a speech that, that the European leader had given once before. How do you see that? I think all bets are off. I mean, it's clear that you can get away with a lot more, largely because I think the people are um, immunized by watching Kim Kardashian or watching Honey Boo Boo or whatever. And, and then the 24-7 news cycle where, you know, the next thing comes up so that they don't stop and think about one particular, you know, plagiarism charge or some, you know, peccadillo that would really have killed a candidate. And, and in, once upon a time when you were to write a book like this, you would have to write the candidates cautiously to mirror the way we would have run a campaign to make once a upon candidate a time. cautiously. Yeah. And, and so now it's, it, it almost requires a lot more imagination <laughs> and, and to write the book, but uh, to catch up to reality is also difficult. A, a different time, as you said. Well, let's, uh, the book is called The First First Gentleman. Uh, Gerald Weaver, it's, it, it's, a, it's a fun read. As you said, thriller, love story, look at inside politics, all sorts of things. Uh, good to have you on. Thank you. You'll be well. All right.